Good Sunday morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. President Trump touting the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice nominee Brett Kavanaugh as an historic victory. Plus, the Justice Department's number two expected back on Capitol Hill to face new questionings this upcoming week. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I'm Maria Bartiromo. This is Sunday Morning Futures. The president praising Justice Brett Kavanaugh and fellow Republicans for rejecting pressure from the, quote, left-wing mob. Democrats are vowing to investigate Kavanaugh once again if they take back power in November. Republican Senator Roy Blunt will join me with an exclusive interview coming up. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein is set to appear before Congress this week to answer questions as lawmakers learn this week about another source feeding information to the FBI before the agency launched its investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. The very latest from the chairman of the House Intel Committee, Devin Nunes, is here live coming up. And the White House may be succeeding in uniting with U.S. allies to take on China's abusive trade policies. Will the new pact with Mexico and Canada force China to the negotiating table? I'll talk with White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow in an exclusive interview this morning. Plus, Foreign Affairs Committee member Daryl Issa is here as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures right now. All of those stories coming up, but we begin right now with the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, marking a major victory for the Trump administration. The Senate narrowly confirmed Kavanaugh yesterday after weeks of heated debate and mass protests on Capitol Hill all weekend. The president celebrating the moment with supporters in Kansas while underscoring the importance of the midterm elections now just four weeks away. I stand before you today on the heels of a tremendous victory for our nation, our people, and our beloved Constitution. Over the past few weeks, every American has now seen the profound stakes in the upcoming election. And joining me right now is Republican California Congressman Devin Nunes. He is chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. And Mr. Chairman, it is good to see you this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Great. Great to be here again. Well, now, Brett Kavanaugh will start his new job uh, pr pretty soon, next week, on the Supreme Court. Your reaction to what has taken place this weekend? Well, I'll tell you, it really shows the divide between what you have in Washington, D.C., and New York City, and that whole beltway, and all the big cities in America who have been buying into this mob-like mentality of opposing a Supreme Court justice nominee for apparently no reason. In contrast, Maria, I've been out here in, in the rural part of California in my district for the last week, and I cannot go anywhere to any coffee shop, any grocery store, anywhere without somebody bringing up Judge Kavanaugh and how upset they are, not only by what they're doing to him and his family, but also by the behavior of politicians. And it looks like total chaos in Washington, D.C., when really the opposite is true. We've never had it so good in this country. Well, you know, when you look at the outcomes that the president has had, uh, they've been very positive, from economic to obviously the uh, the judge namings, uh, uh, judicials, uh, as, well, uh, as well as obviously the Supreme Court. But it's interesting to see the hate coming from the left. I mean, Susan Collins voted, obviously, very important to get her vote to confirm Kavanaugh. She's been flooded with abusive tweets, uh, threatening death, violence. Uh, to Susan Collins. We, we see the, the protesters continuing. Where do things go from here, Congressman, given the level of hate and upset on the left and the shaming tactics? Well, I think this is what you've been seeing for the last two years. It's been, it's been done to the President of the United States. You've got a bunch of billionaires working with the fake news media and the Democratic Party to bring up hoaxes, fake news stories, they rile up their base, and, they, and now you have a whole bunch of Americans out there you know, who believe things that just aren't true. So you couple that uh, with what you've seen with all these crazy protests, and you know, when you actually ask, what are you protesting about, they can't answer the question, right? And you cover this every day on your show. Uh, the economy's doing well, the military's being rebuilt, trade agreements are, be, are getting done, Yet, what, what do you see and what are they protesting? Nobody understands. That's why out in real America, people are like, what, what the heck is going on there? And, and that's why I say what, what you saw happen, really, and I'll sum it down to this. You saw what's been happening to members of Congress, what's been happening to the president with sit-ins, die-ins, protests, blocking streets, you know, violence. Mm. 
You now saw that done to, number one, a federal judge, and now United States senators. And I think the American people have now woke up to the fact that this is not normal behavior for people to be doing in this country. Yeah, and that's what we saw last week. We've got a couple of examples of it that we want to show because this new strategy of getting in your face was really ramped up as the uh, confirmation process yeah. took place last week. Watch this. Why are you putting your hands on her? She's walking. Excuse I keep, me. I keep stepping on her feet. Do you want the Republican Party to be the public party that is known okay. for promoting rape and sexual assault? Don't you wave your hand at me. I wave my hand at you. When you grow up, I'll be running. When I grow up, we grow up. When I grow up, grow up. You you grow up. Grow up. Grow up. How dare you talk to women that way? Don't put a liar on the court. 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 Not to mention the so-called doxing where uh, an intern for Sheila Jackson, a Democrat Sheila Jackson, as well as uh, Barbara Boxer, uh, the intern was arrested last week for putting the personal information, addresses, phone numbers of Lindsey Graham, uh, uh, of Mike Lee, and Orrin Hatch on the Internet. Yeah, I mean, that's what you're seeing, Maria. This is what's happening all over America. It's been happening to, uh, to many of my colleagues, including myself, for, for a couple years. But can you imagine if at the beginning of the Russia investigation, if myself or Trey Gowdy would have started asking questions of top DOJ official, officials, if we would have brought out the yearbook and started paging through the year, their high school yearbooks and started asking them questions, okay? Yeah. Two years ago, a year and a half ago, we would have been laughed at, we would have been mocked, we, it would have been the biggest joke. And it, by the way, it should have been a joke. So, so do you now think you this has changed? Now you have the normalization yeah. of this. Do you think this has changed uh, the dynamics going into the midterms now four weeks away? I, I do because you because most Americans know it's absolutely ridiculous to have United States senators asking a federal judge about his yearbook entries. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So yeah. I, I hope that, you know, you had tens of millions of people paying attention to this. So I think for the first time now, you actually have Republicans and independents who have woke up to the fact that they better get out and vote or you're going to put these lunatics back in charge of this country. Yeah, I want to I want to switch gears and ask you about the other big news of the week, Congressman, and that is Jim Baker and what he said uh, about in his testimony about this FBI investigation into the Trump Russia collusion and that narrative, which we've spoken about so many times. So stay with us, Congressman Devin Nunes is with me. We'll get his thoughts on what Republicans are calling explosive developments this week in their investigation into the Justice Department and the 2016 election. That's next. Follow me on Twitter at Maria Bart. Romo at Sunday Futures. Stay with us more with Devin Nunez as we come right back and look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. Welcome back. House Republicans are expected to hold a closed door interview with Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein this upcoming week. This follows new revelations in the congressional probe into the Department of Justice's handling of the investigation into the 2016 Trump campaign. Last week, former top FBI official James Baker reportedly told investigators there was another source feeding information to the FBI before the agency launched a probe of the Trump campaign. Republicans are calling it a bombshell. Some of the things that uh, were shared were explosive in nature. I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe that I was hearing some of the testimony that uh, here in the United States uh, that the DOJ and FBI were involved with. During the time prior to the election, there was another source giving information directly to the FBI, which we found the source to be pretty explosive. And this additional source, he's being identified as Michael Sussman, a former DOJ prosecutor with links to the Democratic National Committee. Sources say he reached out to the FBI to provide documents on Russian hacking. I'm back now with House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunes. And Mr. Chairman, connect the dots for us to tell us why this is important here. We know that you've been investigating the origin of this investigation that took place into Trump and Russia collusion, which, mm -hmm. of course, was never existent. So tell us why this James Baker news is important. Well, it's very simple. James Baker was the top lawyer at the FBI, reported directly to James Comey. Numerous officials at the DOJ and the FBI have told us under oath that 
the FBI, nobody at FBI or DOJ knew anything about the Democratic Party being behind the Clinton dirt. Well, now you have one of the top lawyers for the Democrats and the Clinton campaign who was feeding information directly to the top lawyer at the FBI during, before even the FISA warrant. So, so now you have absolute proof that that wasn't told to the FISA court. So you want your, your evidence of FISA abuse? There it is right there. A secret warrant was, gotten, again, was, was placed on an American citizen during a political campaign, and yet the FBI did not tell the court that they were getting this information directly from the opponent of that campaign. And, and this, is, this is really bad stuff. It's, it's, it's very simple. I mean, you just had a, 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 it's not complicated. People should know. It's probably not appropriate for a top lawyer, lawyer of the Democratic Party to take dirt and give it to the top lawyer at the FBI. And once again, they did not tell the FISA judge when they were looking to get that FISA warrant to wiretap Carter Page because he was on the Trump campaign, they did not tell the FISA judge that the information was coming from the DNC. That is correct. And, and, that, and not only that, you also have that many officials have told us numerous times that they had no idea where it's coming from. And don't forget, you had originally the story from FBI and DOJ was that Republicans had started this information and given this information, and that has been totally blown out of the water. Republicans had nothing to do with it, and the top levels of the FBI absolutely knew this, right? I mean, you can't possibly argue that the top lawyer for the FBI meets with the top lawyer for the Democratic Party and just doesn't tell anyone. Hmm. And so then you, you fast forward four months later, Four months later, when they come and present the information to Congress, they say, well, we believe that Republicans were behind this. No, Republicans were never behind it. You knew the whole time who was behind it, the Democrats were, and it was so explosive and so damaging that that's why they didn't want us to know. And this is why the President of the United States has got to declassify the information we've been asking for. If he doesn't declassify it, he's going to let these criminals, this criminal activity and fraudulent behavior People are going to get away with it if this information is not declassified so that all the American people well, can see. Well, you're four weeks, away, oh, four weeks away from the midterm elections. Is he going to declassify before the midterm elections? I mean, this, is, this seems to be a, a critical piece of information that yeah. the American people need to know. <laughs> well, look, he ordered it done. He yeah. ordered it done three weeks ago. He said he, said he, wanted, he was ordering immediately with no redactions. And then what happened? A few days later... You had Rod Rosenstein convene all the top people, okay, the same people that are involved right. and that signed the FISA, that have been blocking Congress from getting information. They all met with the president and, and told the president that we can't do it because allies might get concerned. So, so, so I mean, you, this, this, none yeah. of this is, none of, you can't buy any of this from these guys. So you have a meeting, or Rod Rosenstein is going to be meeting with lawmakers next week. Tell us what you're expecting from this meeting from Rod Rosenstein next week. Uh, you already interviewed Andrew mm -hmm. McCabe. Does what McCabe said jive with what Rosenstein has told you? Well, well, this is going to be the real question, right? You had the you had the he said she said one in the New York Times where McCabe's people said that that definitely Rod Rosenstein was was wanting to wear a wire to go in and record secretly record the president of the United States so that they could use the Twenty Fifth Amendment to remove him. I mean that's a that's a bombshell of a claim, right? If you really had the Deputy Attorney General who's in charge of the Russia investigation, who appointed the special counsel willing to go do that. Now, in the Washington Post, you kind of had a, a well, I, I didn't really say that. It seems like it was coming from Rosenstein and the Department of Justice's people. I really didn't say that. I was just joking. Now, hmm. I don't believe that's a joke. I don't think it's something you would joke about. Yeah. You know, pretty serious stuff that you say, I'm going to wear a wire and go in and secretly record the president of the United States. Yeah. Does Rod Rosenstein have a problem? Well, I think it all comes down to whether or not he was willing to wear a wire or not. If he was willing to wear a wire and secretly record the president, Maria, uh, it's uh, some place that this country's never been before. I, I don't know of any time in the history of this country where you had people who are at the top levels of government conspiring to secretly court a president so that you can trap the president into doing so, into being able to go after the 25th Amendment to remove the president. Mm.
That's serious stuff. Yeah. So you're going to talk about that with Rosenstein next week. Anything else we should expect from this meeting when he heads to Capitol Hill? Well, I think those are going to be the questions that have to be that have to be answered by Rosenstein. He needs to tell us uh, really what uh, what he meant by this joke of willingness to wear to wear a wire. And don't forget that this is a very important point. When Rosenstein appointed the special counsel, the lead investigators knew that there was no evidence of the Trump campaign colluding with the Russians. So what has the special counsel been doing this whole time? It really looks like it's pretty clear now that it is an investigation in search of a crime. Because the very thing the Trump campaign was investigated for, colluding with Russians, we now know that it was the Democratic Party colluding with Russians and feeding it to the top levels of the FBI, the general counsel of the FBI. Wow. Wow. Uh, have you spoken with, with Robert Mueller in any way? I mean, are you calling for Mueller's investigation to be shut down as a result of what you just said? Well, I don't want the investigators to be shut down. What I want the investigation to do is, is determine who leaked the Flynn conversations, who leaked General Flynn's conversations. I want them to investigate that. I want them to investigate who was behind Fusion GPS, who was Fusion GPS talking to, what Russians were they talking to? Who was Christopher Steele talking to? I want to know all the Russians that Fusion GPS right. interviewed, got information from, funneled into the Democrat Party, and then the Democratic Party funneled it to the FBI to open an investigation. That's what the Mueller investigation should be looking at. Understood. Because I don't know what the hell they were looking at this whole time. Wow. Congressman, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks very much. We'll be watching. A big week. Always a pleasure. Certainly. Devin Nunes joining us there. Well, after a wrenching debate, Brett Kavanaugh is sworn in as the 114th Supreme Court Justice. Democrats say the fight is not over. Missouri Senator Roy Blunt, a member of the Republican leadership, will join me next in an exclusive interview. Stay with us. Welcome back. New Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh is preparing for his first week on the job. House Democrats, though, say they are not finished with him yet. Donald Trump Jr. warning in a tweet, quote, Trump supporters, you better believe that Democrats are going to do everything in their power to impeach Kavanaugh from the Supreme Court if they take control of Congress in November. Yesterday, the top Democrat on the House Judiciary Committee vowed to investigate Kavanaugh if Democrats win control of the House. Congressman Jerry Nadler telling The New York Times, quote, this, we are going going to have to do something to provide a check and balance to protect the rule of law and to protect the legitimacy of one of the, our most important institutions. Now, an exclusive interview right now, Missouri Republican Senator Roy Blunt, Vice Chairman of the Senate Republican Congress uh, Conference. Rather, Senator, good to see you this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Good to be with you, Maria. Do you agree the fight is not over yet? Well, I, I, that sounds very much in keeping with where the Democrats have been from day one. You know, Senator Schumer said he would do anything possible to keep Brett Kavanaugh from going on the court. But frankly, I think they're making a big mistake here, holding this information, rolling it out in the most uh, unfair way to everybody involved after they'd had it for months, now talking about uh, if we get in charge, we're going to look at this in some other way. Frankly, what they've managed to do is energize the Republican base uh, in a way that usually the party that just won a presidential election isn't energized in the next election cycle. Uh, but what they really continue to do is this unfair, uh, really t totally unrealistic behavior of guilty until proven innocent of uh, whatever uh, we can do to stop uh, our political opponents from uh, being able to do what voters gave, put them in place to do. I just don't think it works. It doesn't work for them. Frankly, I think the more they talk about the kinds of things that Congressman Adler apparently has said, uh, the worse it will be for them. But they, can, they, they can't stop them, and uh, they obviously uh, aren't uh, think this is a political tactic that works for them. I don't think it works at all. So, so what do the midterms look like at this point in your, from your standpoint? Have things changed given the level of hate and, and attack on the left? Well, things have changed. You know, we'll see in uh, four weeks and a, a couple of days how much they've changed. It's clear that things have changed again. Uh, conservative voters, Republican voters, constitutional conservatives are energized like they weren't before. 
Uh, but uh, if, any, if we've learned anything from President Trump, it's how short the news cycle is. And we'll see whether this is sustained or not. I believe it will be. I think the, the, the tactics used by Democrats in, in the Senate, the obvious presidential politics that several members of that committee and, and the Senate were pursuing, uh, just look like that uh, uh, the politics doesn't ever end. The campaigns have gotten uh, out of control, and now they want to carry that right into daily governing. And um, I, I think it's not going to work for them. You know, Judge Kavanaugh is probably the uh, most uh, in, investigated, vetted uh, person maybe in the history of confirmations, yeah. seven confirmations, uh, nothing that began, no, nothing. And by the way, in every one of those questions, in every one of those uh, those uh, seven background checks, right. questions about drinking are asked, questions about have you ever heard anything uh, that we should follow up on. Uh, one reason those uh, actual background checks themselves need to remain confidential is you never want people to be hesitant right. uh, to say, well, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard this, uh, and that's uh, what's happened with Judge Kavanaugh yeah. seven times, and nobody's ever heard anything. Yeah, meanwhile, where does the Senate go now in terms of this lack of civility and these attacks? Susan Collins has been flooded with hate tweets. Uh, I'll read you one of them. Uh, I hope someone kills you. Um, I will not mourn your death, another one says. Uh, I, I, I can't even read the rest. It, it's, it's actually disgusting. Here's Chuck Grassley, who joined me last week on Mornings with Maria on Fox Business to talk about uh, what has taken place here. Listen. I also think that the resistance that's been in existence since November 2016 uh, is headquartered here on Capitol Hill when you have Congresswomen say that you get in the face of anybody that's in the cabinet. We have senators say get in the face. We ought to be setting an example of civility as uh, leaders and public servants uh, not encouraging that incivility that the resistance is very much uh, uh, you, uh, their modi, modus operandi. What does it look like to you in terms of getting things done, executing an agenda, when you've got this kind of division and hate? Well, we, we actually oddly have gotten a lot done in this Congress. Yes, you from, have. Uh, uh, the appropriations bills at the right time, the FAA extension we just did, the opioid bill, the increase in uh, health care funding. Uh, we're getting a lot done, but nobody's able to, to, to see that because of, uh, of uh, so much noise and uh, so much coverage of that noise. Clearly, you know, I, I chaired the inauguration. I was there in, in, in charge that day, and I said, what we're really good at in this country, where we set a standard for everybody else, is the transfer of power. But this is an election where the side that lost has not been willing to accept the transfer of power, uh, to be the the uh, reliable questioner of what's going on, yep. uh, but not to challenge the constitutional uh, opportunities that are there. You know, just trying to get uh, undersecretaries of this and that and the other confirmed in today's Senate mm. has been almost impossible. and. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, fight we just went through shows how far I think the other side is prepared to, to take this. Yeah, and, and by the way, it seems like this Kavanaugh fight has brought the never Trumpers on the Republican side together with the president. I mean, uh, even those people who did not accept President Trump on the Republican side uh, got, got together with him to make sure that Kavanaugh w was concerned, so uh, was confirmed. So it seems like it has improved relations. Is that a fair statement? Well, I think when you when you see what the president gets done, as opposed to not to maybe the way he does it, the strong, this unbelievably strong yeah. economy, trade bills that seem to be uh, coming together, uh, the ability to put people on the court that will look at the Constitution and the law that and see what it says, I, I think there is a sense among Republicans that this fight is better than your personal feelings about anybody in it. Sure. Uh, and I think there has been a consolidation and uh, the president himself. I think has begun to appreciate in ways that he might not have before mm. how important it is that you uh, support the people that support you and work with them and give them an opportunity to get things done. Senator, good to have you on the program. Thanks very much. Good to be with you. Senator Roy Blunt joining us there. And we're talking about the agenda right now, the Trump trade agenda moving forward following a new deal with Mexico and Canada. What does it mean for the standoff with China? I'll talk with White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow in an exclusive interview right here live next.
Welcome back. New reaction this morning to President Trump fulfilling a major campaign pledge to renegotiate one of America's biggest trade deals, NAFTA. Here's the president touting the new deal, now called the USMCA. It's my great honor to announce that we have successfully completed negotiations on a brand new deal to terminate and replace NAFTA. The agreement will govern nearly $1.2 trillion in trade, which makes it the biggest trade deal in the United States history. Now, this agreement between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada is raising some questions over the ongoing U.S. trade dispute with China. What will that look like with a unified group against China? Joining me right now in an exclusive interview is Larry Kudlow. He's assistant to the president for economic policy and director of the National Economic Council. Larry, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Let's talk first on trade. Obviously, a big deal that Canada got done and this new USMCA is in place. When do you expect the American people to feel the effects of this new trade deal? Well, look, uh, it's got to go through some paperwork and it's got to go through a vote in, uh, in Congress. But the key point here is that this new deal opens up a lot of markets for American farmers. Uh, big help to American workers, you know, Main Street blue-collar workers. Um, much better conditions, much better resolution of some issues. It happens to have, open up financial services, uh, digital services. I think it's a very good deal. And I think now all the supply chains in North America uh, are going to continue to work out well. President said he wants to help the U.S. negotiate better deals. I think this is a good template for that. Uh, Got to remember what it says now, U.S. MCA. We all have to memorize that new one. Shouldn't be too hard. I'd say it's pro-growth, Maria, but it's going to take a while to kick in. And you've already seen very strong pro-growth policies lifting the economy. We got the jobs number out on, on Friday, which some people questioned being a little lower than expected, but the prior two months were revised upward. How would you characterize the jobs picture right now and the economic growth prospects, Larry? I think it's pretty remarkable, to be honest with you. You're absolutely right about the revisions um, prior months. So September is actually 211,000 above uh, August. So that's a big number. Remarkably, the 3.7% unemployment rate, which we haven't had for decades, very rare. There is basically no inflation. Here's a point, a uh, good story in the paper. You know, the lower end is actually getting faster wage increases. I think these are predominantly, Maria, blue-collar workers, um, less skilled than uh, some of the techie people, but they are actually getting faster wage increases than the upper end. Hmm. And that's pretty remarkable, I think. And we've seen this uh, throughout. Blue-collar workers, a uh, big story in the paper a couple of weeks ago, blue-collar workers having their best increase in many, many years. President Trump, you know, is opened up the economies, lower tax rates, deregulation, lowered energy. He stopped the war against business. He stopped the war against success. He stopped the war against energy. Uh, right now, the American economy is crushing it, and it's going to go on for a while, in my judgment. For a while is what people are questioning, because there's a narrative out there, Larry, as you know, that things are going to start to slow down pretty significantly going into 2020 and in 2020 because of higher interest rates and some demographic issues. Do you see that slowdown on the horizon? I sure don't. Now, look, 2020 is a couple years away. I think we're in the biggest capital goods business investment spending in 20 years, okay? This is an economy that looks more like the 80s and 90s. Uh, we've beaten the 2% growth margin. Everybody said we couldn't. Uh, Atlanta Fed says it's going to be 4% again in the third quarter. Uh, our team would take 3% plus. They said it couldn't be done. It is being done. Capital goods is going to put uh, better productivity for workers. We're already seeing the wage gains. Yeah. Uh, consumer spending is holding up. I, I just don't see where this is going to end. Here, here, one last point. If you can keep more of what you earn, right, if your mm. paychecks are bigger after tax, after inflation, that goes on. If we're right. building new business investment, 
plants, equipment, technology, campuses, you name it. Why can't that go on for a good many years? Yeah. We haven't had that in almost 20 years. Well, one issue is this trade fight with China that, 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 that prices are going to go up for some common goods that people buy because of these tariffs that are in place. I know it's more than just an economic issue. We've got a map here of the South China Sea uh, because this is one of the issues that many people have been saying is one for America with regard to national security. China is uh, building islands in the South China Sea, which we all know it does not own the South China Sea. It's building islands and then putting military bases on those islands. So what's your take in terms of where this uh, fight with China goes now that the president has done this deal with Canada and Mexico? And I want to get your take on Europe and Japan as well. Well, look, um this whole story on trade is coming together nicely. Uh, the president's strategy appears to be working. We see this with U.S. Uh, MCA. Now, we are holding trade negotiations uh, with Europe. We are holding trade negotiations with Japan. Uh, we issued a tripart letter, the three countries, uh, basically saying non-market economies, read China on that, uh, have got to shape up. China yeah. is probably the biggest culprit, as you know. Um, so, look, the key issues here, uh, high tariffs, high non-tariff barriers, um, technology uh, theft, in, uh, uh, intellectual property theft. There's a story in the paper yesterday in yeah. the Wall Street Journal. Let me put this out. China expands its cybersecurity rulebook, heightening foreign corporate concerns. This is brand new. Mm -hmm. They're putting in new rules that will permit Chinese officials to inspect U.S. companies and all foreign companies' information tech and access proprietary information. This is exactly a step in the wrong direction. This is forced technology transfer. This is IP theft. This is exactly what we've been warning about. Right. We've tried to communicate these concerns to China. So far, we've not had luck. Look, we'll talk to them. Serious and significant talks any time, but it looks to me like they're moving in the wrong direction right now. I think this is most unfortunate. You know, you talk about national security issues. I'm going to talk about economic security issues. Right. Why should we allow the Chinese to own American companies in China and moreover, and moreover, force us to lay out all of our technology blueprints and the name of cybersecurity, which, by the way, they cyber hack us constantly. Why should we give them uh, new advantages yeah. in this uh, race for technology? And, and the question so that's is... That's a big problem going forward. Is, is tariff the right solution here? When you check, take a short break and, and come back to this, because you are dealing with a dictator for life. Meanwhile, Vice President Mike Pence is accusing China of meddling in U.S. elections. More on that. And California Republican Congressman Daryl Issa will join me next here more with Larry Kudlow as well. Stay with us. Welcome back. New reaction this morning to President Trump fulfilling a major campaign pledge to renegotiate one of America's biggest trade deals, NAFTA. Here's the president touting the new deal, now called the USMCA. It's my great honor to announce that we have successfully completed negotiations on a brand new deal to terminate and replace NAFTA. The agreement will govern nearly 1.2 trillion in trade, which makes it the biggest trade deal in the United States history. Now, this agreement between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada is raising some questions over the ongoing U.S. trade dispute with China. What will that look like with a unified group against China? Joining me right now in an exclusive interview is Larry Kudlow. He's assistant to the president for economic policy and director of the National Economic Council. Larry, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Let's talk first on trade. Obviously, a big deal that Canada got done and this new USMCA is in place. When do you expect the American people to feel the effects of this new trade deal? Well, look, uh, it's got to go through some paperwork and it's got to go through a vote in, uh, in Congress. But the key point here is that this new deal opens up a lot of markets for American farmers. Uh, big help to American workers, you know, Main Street blue-collar workers. Um, much better conditions, much better resolution of some issues. It happens to have open up financial services, uh, digital services. I think it's a very good deal. And I think now all the supply chains in North America 
uh, are going to continue to work out well. President said he wants to help the U.S. negotiate better deals. I think this is a good template for that. Uh, Got to remember what it says now, U.S. MCA. We all have to memorize that new one. Shouldn't be too hard. I'd say it's pro-growth, Maria, but it's going to take a while to kick in. And you've already seen very strong pro-growth policies lifting the economy. We got the jobs number out on, on Friday, which some people questioned being a little lower than expected, but the prior two months were revised upward. How would you characterize the jobs picture right now and the economic growth prospects, Larry? I think it's pretty remarkable, to be honest with you. You're absolutely right about the revisions um, prior months. So September is actually 211,000 above uh, August. So that's a big number. Remarkably, the 3.7% unemployment rate, which we haven't had for decades, very rare. There is basically no inflation. Here's a point, a uh, good story in the paper. You know, the lower end is actually getting faster wage increases. I think these are predominantly, Maria, blue-collar workers, uh, less skilled than uh, some of the techie people. But they are actually getting faster wage increases than the upper end. Hmm. And that's pretty remarkable, I think. And we've seen this uh, throughout. Blue-collar workers, a uh, big story in the paper a couple of weeks ago, blue-collar workers having their best increase in many, many years. President Trump, you know, is opened up the economies, lowered tax rates, deregulation, lowered energy. He stopped the war against business. He stopped the war against success. He stopped the war against energy. Uh, right now, the American economy is crushing it, and it's going to go on for a while, in my judgment. For a while is what people are questioning, because there's a narrative out there, Larry, as you know, that things are going to start to slow down pretty significantly going into 2020 and in 2020 because of higher interest rates and some demographic issues. Do you see that slowdown on the horizon? I sure don't. Now, look, 2020 is a couple years away. I think we're in the biggest capital goods business investment spending in 20 years, okay? This is an economy that looks more like the 80s and 90s. Uh, we've beaten the 2% growth margin. Everybody said we couldn't. Uh, Atlanta Fed says it's going to be 4% again in the third quarter. Uh, our team would take 3% plus. They said it couldn't be done. It is being done. Capital goods is going to put uh, better productivity for workers. We're already seeing the wage gains. Yeah. Uh, consumer spending is holding up. I, I just don't see where this is going to end. Here, here, one last point. If you can keep more of what you earn, right, if your mm. paychecks are bigger after tax, after inflation. That goes on. If we're right. building new business investment, plants, equipment, technology, campuses, you name it, why can't that go on for a good many years? Yeah. We haven't had that in almost 20 years. Well, one issue is this trade fight with China that, 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 that prices are going to go up for some common goods that people buy because of these tariffs that are in place. I know it's more than just an economic issue. We've got a map here of the South China Sea uh, because this is one of the issues that many people have been saying is one for America with regard to national security. China is uh, building islands in the South China Sea, which we all know it does not own the South China Sea. It's building islands and then putting military bases on those islands. So what's your take in terms of where this uh, fight with China goes now that the president has done this deal with Canada and Mexico? And I want to get your take on Europe and Japan as well. Well, look, um this whole story on trade is coming together nicely. Uh, the president's strategy appears to be working. We see this with U.S. Uh, MCA. Now, we are holding trade negotiations uh, with Europe. We are holding trade negotiations with Japan. Uh, we issued a tripart letter, the three countries, uh, basically saying non-market economies, read China on that, uh, have got to shape up. China yeah. is probably the biggest culprit, as you know. Um, so, look, the key issues here, uh, high tariffs, high non-tariff barriers, um, technology uh, theft, in, uh, uh, intellectual property theft. There's a story in the paper yesterday in yeah. the Wall Street Journal. Let me put this out. China expands its cybersecurity rulebook, heightening foreign corporate concerns. This is brand new. Mm -hmm. They're putting in new rules that will permit Chinese officials to inspect 
U.S. companies and all foreign companies' information tech and access proprietary information. This is exactly a step in the wrong direction. This is forced technology transfer. This is IP theft. This is exactly what we've been warning about. Right. We've tried to communicate these concerns to China. So far, we've not had luck. Look, we'll talk to them. Serious and significant talks any time, but it looks to me like they're moving in the wrong direction right now. I think this is most unfortunate. You know, you talk about national security issues. I'm going to talk about economic security issues. Right. Why should we allow the Chinese to own American companies in China and moreover, and moreover, force us to lay out all of our technology blueprints and the name of cybersecurity, which, by the way, they cyber hack us constantly. Why should we give them uh, new advantages yeah. in this uh, race for technology? And, and the question well, that's is, a big problem going forward. Is, is tariff the right solution here? We're going to check, take a short break and, and come back to this because you are dealing with a dictator for life. Meanwhile, Vice President Mike Pence is accusing China of meddling in U.S. elections. More on that. And California Republican Congressman Daryl Issa will join me next here. More with Larry Kudlow as well. Stay with us.